Uh, Brian London, publisher of the Gold Newsletter and also the producer of the famous uh, uh, New Orleans Investment Conference. Brian, welcome. Great to be with you, Jack. Brian, we're having a, a very uh, exciting few days uh, in gold. Uh, you know, the market, yeah. I mean, <laughs> gold is up almost $200. Is it $200 now in two days? Uh, more like, I would say, about $140 in the last... Close enough, close enough. What's sixty dollars? Yeah. You know, between friends, right? Uh, what um, I think one of the questions that's on you know everybody's mind right now with investors is, you know, I think a lot of a lot of investors have, have been expecting gold really to to rally going into this whole you know coronavirus situation, a market crash, yeah. and maybe they were looking for like a safe haven. That's always been, I think, the theory with gold. But you know, the, mm -hmm. the, but you know, gold really um, kind of dropped, and now the last two days, it's it's uh, like an epic two days. I mean, massive rally. What is you know what is this all about? Well, we've gotten past the forced selling, uh, liquidation for liquidity's sake phase of this crisis. You know that this all of this happened before in 2008, we, we saw a very similar situation, a similar dynamic in that the, the gold, gold went down along with stocks as uh, investors and primarily speculators needed to raise cash for margin calls and the like. They needed to raise cash uh, quickly and they sold anything for which there was a bid and gold really, I like to say it served its purpose. You know, a lot of people, uh, uh, denigrate gold in these kinds of liquidity crunches saying it doesn't rise but in fact it does exactly what it's supposed to do it's the golden piggy bank as it were so that in a time of crisis when you need liquidity when you need funds you can break open that that piggy bank and get them you can always get that through the gold market it's uh, it is uh liquid really 24 hours a day in uh in most places in the world so you you can look on it as that that uh, emergency reserve for cash. Now, in 2008, we had that, that kind of uh, downdraft in gold and silver prices through as we went through that kind of liquidity crunch. Uh, and then we got beyond that and the Fed announced all of those massive unprecedented QE programs right. and the, the price of gold more than doubled over the next couple of years. And, you know, fortunes were made for people who leveraged that move in mining stocks and the like. Uh, we're going through that same kind of a thing right now, but really in a, kind of a turbo fashion. A lot of the things that, that took weeks and even months to play out in, after the 2008 crisis are happening in the, the span of a few days or, or even hours right now. Um, I'm among a, a number of other uh, analysts and newsletter writers in the sector who kind of predicted the, uh, the the massive monetary stimulus programs that we're seeing now. So we kind of anticipated the degree, but nobody really anticipated the rapidity, the speed of this move, and it's, how quickly it's coming. No, I mean, I mean, the the, the velocity is incredible. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, I mean, but the whole, but you know, the move with the markets have, has also been, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, what's the word that they're using? It's uh, unprecedented. <laughs> yeah, and you know, everything, right uh, I tell people that it, you look back 12 years, look back before the 2008 uh, credit crisis, and, and it would have been crazy talk back then to talk about zero interest rates, negative interest rates, quantitative easing. Uh, bank bailouts, all of these things that we've come to accept now, then crazy talk has become normalized. It's it's the way, you know, it's accepted right now. And now they're talking about negative interest rates in the U.S. Who, who knows? It's it's the next logical step. Yeah, yeah. No, we're definitely, you know, we're, we're, we've been hearing that from, you know, some of our guests. And we, you know, uh, we had, there was a Dr. Mark Faber on recently. Yeah, who's, I know Mark well. You yeah. know, he's, he's saying that we're, you know, this was a couple of weeks ago. This is before things really started. He's basically saying that we are, the U.S. is going to go to negative rates. So. Yeah, and, you know, like that's another example of, of crazy talk. And right now it may seem to be crazy talk, but uh, in a few weeks, maybe not. 
You know, one of the, the things I feature in my presentations these days is uh, a chart taken directly from the Fed website uh, the, um, sh from their data showing every rate cutting cycle since the late 1970s. And then I put a, a red line at the bottom of each one of those rate cutting cycles. And what you see is a stair step pattern going ever lower, ever lower until post 2008, we hit zero where we're, we're you know, at the foundation. And then I project what the next step downward on that, that uh, stair step is, and it's into the basement. So, you know, it may seem to be crazy talk, but it is the next progression in a series that goes back decades. What's, uh, Brian, what, what's your outlook uh, for gold right now? Do, where do you think, you know, like, you know, you start off saying that uh, you basically like, you know, the gold doubled, at, you know, and after the, the, the 08 situation. Yeah. And I guess you were kind of leading into, you know, can gold double again from where it is right now? Well, th yeah, then you're talking uh, around $3,000 an ounce gold. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. You know, if I look at the bigger picture, if, if we look at what's happened in terms of the debt situation, uh, sovereign debt in the US, US, the federal debt in the US, but really worldwide, what this more than a decade long experiment in 5,000 year lows and in interest rates has done, one of the effects uh, repercussions of this, these policies has been an enormous creation of debt. The, the debt uh, trajectory was already out of control before this grand experiment, and now it's just uh, it's skyrocketing. And now, of course, we're seeing a situation where we were just getting back to trillion dollar deficits every year in the U.S., which equates to about 1.4 to 1.5 trillion dollar increase in the debt each year. And it looks like we'll probably double that this year of all these stimulus programs coming down the pipe. So when you have debts this large, that means you can no longer have interest rates of any real significance or consequence. In fact, you can't have interest rates that are greater than the rate of inflation. Otherwise, the cost of servicing that debt just craters the federal budget. So that means, in turn, we are going to have negative real rates for ever. Uh, under this monetary regime, we, we absolutely have to have negative real interest rates. And that's enormously bullish for gold and silver and precious metals investments, really, as well as commodities, because these commodities, especially the monetary metals uh, that have a, yield no interest, uh, have no yields, and have actually a, a, a small carrying cost, in an environment where negative real yields per abound and are the de facto standard for even bonds, then uh, gold and silver become the high yielding alternative. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, there, there's sort of you know a lot of things happening all at once. You know, you have you know mm -hmm. kind of this this again this coronavirus situation. You have the market crashing. You have the oil price crash. You have uh, you know, all, all sorts of like, you know, geopolitical things happening, uh, you know, all at once. You know, it's sort of the, yeah. what are the, the, the flock of black swans. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, I tell people that the geopolitical crises and big events are not the reason to buy gold. You, you should never buy gold in reaction to those because... If there is a reaction in the gold price, a positive reaction in the gold price, number one, it's it's not logical. It doesn't make sense over the uh, that there should be a short term reaction in the gold price to some type of a geopolitical crisis or event. Uh, but number two, it's going to fade away very quickly, and you're not going to make money off of that event. What you need to do is look at the the grand sweep of history, the big picture, what's going, what's happening monetarily. And it's only uh, concerns over the the value of currencies, of fiat currencies, that drive a long-term bull market in gold and silver. Uh, and that's precisely what we have right now. You don't need to look any further than that to find a, a real reason to, to be invested in the gold and silver sector right now. You know, speaking, speaking of silver, um... You know the ratio. I think is it's at a historic low. That gold silver ratio. What's yeah. your take on it? Are you? Where do you think there? There. I guess 
I guess kind of where I'm going is where do you think investors can get the most sort of bang for the buck in silver or gold right now? Really silver. Um, there's some factors that have combined to create the historic high in the gold silver ratio over 120. You know, previously the record was about 95 to one gold to silver and now and then it surged to about 120. The reason is because there's a widespread belief, really a fallacy in the market that silver has an industrial component to its pricing. Uh, I'm one of the few, if, if, if not the only uh, analyst out there who who really advocates for the fact that that the industrial component is is recognized very little in uh, the, the silver price. Um, if silver were valued purely on its industrial usages, it would be under five dollars an ounce, in my opinion. The vast majority of its value is monetary in nature. So uh, it, it, that I mean, really it doesn't has been. Right. Yeah, it really has. It's historically, it's it's the other monetary metal. And yes, it does have industrial usages, but silver production is largely as a byproduct metal. So uh, it, its usage doesn't really have much effect on uh, supplies or, or new supplies coming to market. So the the industrial component doesn't really help it or cushion it even on the downside. In fact, in this latest sell-off, uh, in this latest bout of market turmoil, when uh, people are looking at the, the implications of the COVID-19 epidemic and seeing that there's a global recession going to result, well, they're selling anything that has anything to do with economic growth or economic uh, health. So they're selling all the commodities, all the base metals, and then they lumped silver into that. So silver was sold uh, unjustifiably to the downside through oh, those sell costs. Oh, because, and, because you think because people are still viewing it as an industrial metal. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, it has this stigma, if you will, of being an industrial metal. And uh, and it isn't. It really isn't. So it, it was un, uh, unduly punished in that sell off. And the result is that the prices right now are. Uh, incredibly low and uh, incredibly cheap in relation to gold. I tell people that gold and silver, well, it's obvious gold and silver move for the same reasons, but in a gold bull market, a long-term fundamental gold bull market based on monetary factors, silver will outperform gold. It always has. So if you like gold, if you like the thesis behind higher gold prices, you you should love silver and you should buy silver. I just bought some today, in fact. Are you buying uh, the physical? Physical, yeah. And, and in terms of that, it, at this point, the physical market is so overwhelmed, uh, you have to buy whatever you can get in, in physical gold and silver. And there's not much out there at all. The, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is the crazy thing right now. There's, there's a, there's a, just a complete disconnect between the physical and 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 the paper uh, prices. Absolutely. Is it like uh, I mean, what's the premium right now? Like, you are, what do you? By the way, now you prefer? Are you buying the bullion? Like, what's your preferred uh, vehicle? Uh, well, in silver, yes, bullion, not numismatic coins, uh, and they're. There's a range of options available in gold and silver. For silver, if you can find it, I like old U.S. silver coins. Pre-1965, they were 70% silver. Oh, the bags. Yes, 90% silver, okay. actually. The, the junk bags, uh, they call them junk silver. The numismatists, the rare coin collectors call them junk silver. Uh, they're also called bag silver. Um, it is typically the cheapest way you can buy silver, if you can buy it. Um, and a small denomination too. So in you know times of uh, emergency where you would actually have to spend your silver holdings, oh, that's uh, interesting. These small silver coins are uh, much easier to spend than say one ounce or uh, you know silver rounds or silver coins. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Where do you think um, where do you think silver should be trading right now? Like where, in, in your opinion? The silver price? Yeah. Well, it, I can tell you right now that the physical silver uh, 
For example, fiscal silver coins, uh, U.S. silver eagles, typically trade for a couple of dollars above their silver melt value, a couple of dollar premium. And now they're trading for as much as nine dollars. So really, uh, in the fiscal market, the real uh, boots on the ground price of silver is about seven dollars an ounce higher than you see on the COMEX uh, silver futures or paper silver market. Yeah. Uh, but do you th but like that's the real yeah, there's, price? There's the, the premium for the fiscal. But do you think I mean, gold, you know, where do you think silver should be valued at that? Right. Do you think it could be, you know, th you know, because I was I was speaking with another newsletter writer and, you know, we had an interesting discussion about you know, he believes it should be a 10 to one ratio. Mm -hmm. gold silver and I was like wow that's that's that'd be interesting and it makes a lot of sense you know you know he had the thesis made a lot of sense what do you think like silver should be at right now what, what do you think is the fair value of silver well you know you can't tell the market what it should do it's going to do whatever it wants to do um, now as far as ten dollar gold silver ratio that would be an extreme uh, that would be a dramatic overshoot, I think, of equilibrium. Back in the 1800s, when there were, was this great debate over a gold standard or a silver standard, they tried to set the ratio. And there is some uh, some argument for a natural ratio of 16 to 1 gold right. to silver or thereabouts. But if we get to you know even a 50 to 1 ratio uh, of gold to silver right now from 120 to one, you're talking about a dramatic surge in catch up and acceleration in silver values versus gold. So there are way, it's a great way to leverage gold. It's kind of it's known as the poor man's gold, but it's also really the speculator's gold because it's uh, it's like an unexpiring option on the gold price. You get much more torque in silver than you do from gold if you're in a gold bull market that's rising for the right reasons. Now. It's it's fair and necessary to say that it also provides leverage on the downside. So if the gold price is in a downtrend, silver is going to move much more quickly to the downside as well. Yeah, I think we, you know, we've seen that uh, this week, last week. Um, yes, absolutely. And again, there were those factors last week that I'm talking about that, you know, this this industrial stigma that it has really didn't help it out at all last uh, last week and, and during the sell-off of the last couple of weeks. Um, so, Brian, so investors who want to get positioned in the precious metals right now, what would you um, what would you recommend? Are you recommending, uh, you know, in terms of stocks, producers, explorers, mm -hmm. ETFs, physical metal? Like, what's, what's the ideal position for... For somebody who wants to participate in what's going to be, you know, probably a massive, you know, bull run from here. Yeah, you know, given my view, long-term view for metals prices and for the really necessary devaluation of currencies, primarily the dollar, but other currencies in which this, these massive debts have been built up. Uh, given that long-term view, I think everyone who has significant assets needs to protect those holdings with some degree of physical metals, gold and silver, uh, as insurance and uh, in insuring against not an unforeseen or unexpected event, but a fully expected event being the, the inevitable depreciation of currency. So you need to have, say, 5 to 10 percent of your holdings uh, represented in physical metals. And there are a number of ways to do that. Um, and uh, and I actually I go uh, into those in our investor's guide to gold and silver that's available on our website uh, for free. But beyond the physical metals, uh, the mining stocks offer significant leverage to the, uh, the metals in a rising market. Uh, um, if you're willing to do your research and invest some money and subscriptions and newsletters and attending conferences. There are in the junior mining, really the, the junior juniors, the exploration and development stocks that can be exploited by somebody willing to do the research. And there could be tremendous profits made there. That's where we primarily focus in gold newsletter. For someone who's not willing to do that kind of a, uh, research and uh, legwork, 
uh, their best bet is to invest in some of the bigger producers and perhaps just the indices like GDX and uh, GDXJ. Okay. Now, you know, right now a lot of pe a lot of people are are working from home, so the internet's getting strained. And we actually dropped a little bit on the connection. Uh, oh, okay. As you were saying, yeah, the internet's good. So as you were saying, um, you, you like the participating in the juniors. You think that's where people can get sort of the most bang for the buck? Yes, if they're willing to do the research and subscribe to, say, the half dozen or so really quality newsletters covering that sector, uh, perhaps going to, to investment conferences where those junior companies are, are exhibiting uh, and talking to management. If you're willing to do the research, there are inefficiencies in that market that uh, would allow you that make possible tremendous gains if you get into the right stocks at the right time. Um, but if you're not willing to put in that kind of research, uh, and I understand why someone wouldn't be willing to, to put in that much research, then investing in the bigger producers, primarily through the indices like GDX and GDXJ, would be a great way to go as well. No, it's interesting. The, the, you know, the the junior mining space is, uh, you know, it's like a massive minefield. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. very inefficient. Absolutely. But there's also, you know, potential for massive home runs. Uh, yeah. So, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, some some people in our audience, you know, they may not be, you know, familiar. I mean, you're actually, you know, a legend in the in the uh, precious metals uh, markets. But uh, you know, a lot of our our audience is is, is uh, you know more generalist and more, uh, you know, right. Uh, you know, a lot of biotech people, for example. But uh, for those that are, may not be familiar, can you tell our audience what is, you know, a little bit about your background? You know, what's the gold newsletter about? And also, you know, this, the, you know, the famous uh, New Orleans conference that you produce. What, what, tell us about those. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty much uh, continuing the legacy of my mentor in the business, Jim Blanchard, who started Gold Newsletter in 1971. Uh, literally, the day that Nixon announced that he was right. uh, ending, ending convertibility of uh, on an international basis of dollars into gold, um, that's the day that Jim knew that we were going to have a massive uh, spending and inflationary repercussions. So he started Gold Newsletter as uh, a way to advocate for the return of gold ownership, the right of gold ownership to American citizens. People don't realize back then that it was illegal to own gold, um, which is obviously ridiculous. And uh, so Jim did a lot of crazy things to lobby for that and uh, return that right and was successful in 1974. At the end of 1974, they signed the law into effect to legalize gold. And Jim started having in that year uh, investment conferences to teach people how to invest in gold. Um, and that started uh, what became the New Orleans Investment Conference. And we just had our 45th annual event and uh, getting ready to have our next one in uh, mid-October this year. Okay, excellent. And what about the Gold Newsletter? Well, Gold Newsletter continued uh, after that uh, gold was legalized, reporting on economics and uh uh, the philosophy of gold ownership until the mid 80s when the Supreme Court passed a decision, um, made a decision, a ruling that enabled uh, people to mention stocks in investment newsletters. Another thing people don't realize is I, that. I never heard, I didn't even know this. Is that, this, that you weren't allowed to mention stocks? No, uh, it was it was actually called the Low Decision. Um, uh, a newsletter, a publisher couldn't mention stocks or securities without whatever they were writing having been first approved by the SEC, which of course would result in weeks, if not months, of approvals and everything else, and made uh, real actionable information impossible to deliver. Um, so that was, you know, today it seems obvious that's an infring infringement on free speech. And so there was a uh, ruling by the Supreme Court, and that's where the age of alternative investment publications really kind of blossomed. Okay. And, and what do you cover uh, in the Gold Newsletter? What's Well, we uh, 
I report on the economic situation, uh, you know, the big picture. Then I keep drilling down into the metals markets, gold and silver, of the metals, other commodities, really, even sometimes oil and gas or base metals um, or energy metals. And then we do an extensive review, sometimes as many as 30 individual companies in a given month of our recommended stocks, junior stocks in the sector, what news they're making, what we think is going to happen next. Uh, in which we think are buys, holds, or sells. Okay. And do, do, do you cover producers also or just juniors? We do on occasion some producers, but frankly, not a lot. Uh, I really specialize in the junior explorer developer area more than anything else. It, that's an area where I know, uh, if I don't know somebody in the industry, I know somebody who knows them. So I'm only one degree of separation from anybody really in that sector and have a lot of contacts, uh, a vast network, a lot of close friends and associates. So. I, I have an ability to find the next big deal early on, uh, and that's really my value proposition for investors is finding what are really analyzing the big picture, of course, looking for whether I think there's an underlying positive uh, trend in place or not, uh, but finding the new deals out there that and getting my readers into them early in a uh, in a bull market environment. It's it's a very powerful formula. The the gains that we've gotten over the years and the kind of environment that we see coming uh, or really are in process right now are are extraordinary. They're typically measured in hundreds of percent. OK, um, what you know, what do you see right now as sort of I mean, we just had the, the, the you know, the PDAC show uh, you know, a couple yeah. of weeks back. Uh, what do you see as sort of like the interesting, do you see any kind of interesting trends in the, uh, in, in the junior space when it comes to the, the precious metals? Are there any kind of, you know, new themes that are emerging, new, you know, new areas where, where you know, they're fine, where they're getting, good, you know, good uh, drill results? I think it's resorting to uh, back to the old themes of gold and silver. I think those are the hot stories, as it were. One of the specific themes in the juniors that I like and that I've been, you know, uh, preaching to the rafters uh, for really a couple of months now is that there, there are juniors out there who are fully funded uh, for big exploration programs on great prospects. Uh, that are typically open up in the summer. They're at northern latitudes or whatever. And these are the kinds of companies uh, that go quiet during the winter because they can't put out any news. People forget about them. And they may shed, if they didn't yet start drilling, they may shed uh, half or three quarters of their market value during that quiet period. But then as the weather warms up and they, they're ramping up to begin drilling, these companies will go up two or three times in price just in anticipation of drilling. You add on to that, that this market decline has has further cut values by a half or more, and you have the potential for companies that could go up, say, four times in price in current levels before they begin drilling in the summer. And then if they have drill success, well, you know, then all bets are off. But there's uh, there are some companies right now that you can bet on that are exploring where when they begin to start drilling, they may be you may be in a position where they've already doubled in price. Okay, uh, that's 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 an interesting value proposition. So so you, you have all these stocks which you know they're they're at that seasonal low right now, which yeah. has been exaggerated, you know, by the market collapse. Yeah. Uh, now are these the stocks that you mentioned? Are, are they uh, have they picked up in price with the last couple of days of uh, you know the gold soaring? Well, I uh, a little bit, yes, they they're up. But I mean, we're talking about companies, for example, one that I had a bid in on for at seven cents a share for the last uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, and I think my bid was filled at about that uh, that level. It's trading now for maybe nine nine and a half cents. Um, last year, as it was willing or uh, getting ready to to drill its its prospect in. Uh, in British Columbia, uh, it was trading in the mid 20s. Um, 
And yet the winter came in too early and they weren't able to uh, even begin their drilling program and the price dropped because of the market's disappointment. I anticipate that that company with that really high value, high potential target will get back up uh, into the 20s again uh, as that drill program uh, gets ready to begin probably in early June. Um, so I'm buying it now at, you know, these levels, uh, in the hopes that it will be two or three times higher in price before the drills even begin turning. Okay. Yeah. Th and then you have, you know, if they get upside, then if they find something, uh, worth if they while, find something, it could go up, you know, a multiple from there. Okay. Excellent. So, um, let's, let's, talk, so, in, so before, we, before we get into maybe, you mentioning some 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 of your recent picks. Uh, what for somebody that wants to subscribe? Will you have any special offers? Where do they go to 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 learn more about the the letter? Yeah, well, I, I tell you, we have a special offer where people can get a, a report uh, detailing two of my top picks right now, uh, and they can also uh, get a subscription to our Golden Opportunities Letter, which gives my views in the markets. Doesn't reveal stock recommendation, but it gives my ongoing views in the markets, as well as some of our friends in the industry guest uh, submissions, uh, and our investor's guide to gold and silver, which covers everything from every way to invest in metals and uh, in physical bullion through uh, mining stocks, even futures and options. So they can get that package by going to goldnewsletter.com forward slash bonus and, uh, and really just get a good taste of what we do at no charge. Okay. And we'll, we'll have the link uh, down below uh, of the video. Uh, it'll be up there. Uh, but you know, what about, um, you know, they'll get, the, I guess they'll get the info in inside, inside the reports, but just, um, you know, real quick, like what would you say is, you know, what's your criteria for investing in these, uh, in these uh, junior mining companies? Like what's, mm -hmm. what do you look for? Oh, there's a lot of factors. There's, you know, as many as a dozen different factors you need to look at. You, uh, you need to look at just to, to give you some of you need to look at the structure of the company. You need to know how many shares are outstanding, how many warrants are out there, uh, at what price recent financings were done, when the, the, the stock that was issued in those private placements, when that's becoming free trading, because that can depress that kind of uh, burst of stock onto the market can depress the share price need to look at what they're doing, what kind of targets they're going after. Are they small to middling targets or, or are they the kinds of targets that if they're successful uh, will gain the market's attention? You need to look at the management team. That's one of the most important things to look at. Uh, make sure they're, they're uh, uh, executives, geologists, financiers, a, a, a team that has done it before, has had success before. Um, and knows how to do it and does it, does things the right way. So uh, there's a long laundry list of things you need to look at. And it takes some experience to to be able to do that yourself in this market. That's why I, I tell I tell people, if you're going to get involved, do the research, invest in the the uh, the education. That means subscribing to at least two or three newsletters in in my investors guide report. I list all of the top newsletter writers out there, my friendly competitors out there, uh, give you uh, list them, tell you how to contact them. Uh, all of the conferences, including my own, but also other ones that, that are great to attend. But if you can do a little bit of research, educate yourself in the sector, uh, there are this tremendous potential for tremendous gains. And, you know, in the junior space, where do you focus? Do you focus on companies on the Canadian list, that do you look at, you know, the ASX, the London, the it was it the AIM, the, or over the look, what's what's your universe? Primarily Canadian stocks. Uh, the, the Canadian uh, regulatory uh, uh, system uh, is the best out there for resource stocks, for mining and exploration stocks. Uh, you know, the reputation of Vancouver wasn't the best. They had every manner of scam imaginable by man perpetrated on investors in the old days. But out of that, you have a regulatory system that knows how to regulate against every manner of scam that's ever been perpetrated 
on investors. And and yet the, that sector is small enough that it can be fairly well regulated. Um, in the U.S., in the small cap arena over the counter market, uh, there's just too many stocks out there uh, for to be regulated successfully or fairly or, or adequately. Um, and companies that are, say, they're exploring for uh, metals or minerals and are only listed in the U.S. or only listed on the over-the-counter markets and not in Canada are something I would uh, studiously avoid because they're trying to avoid the uh, regulatory regime in Canada, which is uh, large, very good. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's actually a very interesting point. Um, now, what about, what about like London or, or, or the Australian uh, exchange? Completely different markets. The Australian market for uh, mining stocks has been on fire for a few years now, uh, but it's a different market. You have to go in there with um, really an advocate on the ground in Australia. You're talking about obviously big time zone changes, et cetera. You have to have some level of trust with somebody in that market. Uh, they also have a different uh, <clears throat> uh, aptitude for issuing stock in Australia. Uh, the, the average company has 10 or more times as much stock issued, sometimes billions of shares uh, listed. And frankly, I, I steer clear of that area because I'm not uh, an expert in that area. I kind of stick to my bailiwick and where I have the, the best network, that being in the, the North American markets. The same thing for uh, for AIM. Um, you have a looser, much looser regulatory environment there for uh, for mining issue, mining stocks, resource stocks, uh, and I just feel much more comfortable in the Canadian markets. That's that's a ver that's a very that's a very interesting point. Um, so, so basically, you have a little bit more regulatory safety in 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 you know in the Canadian market, and yeah. you're a little bit closer to the people. Okay, okay. How many now? What's the right now? Like, how many companies? How many uh, companies are there on the, with the TS uh, TSX venture? What like what's the universe right now of in the? Uh, so where the uh, you know it, it's it's hard to say. There's been an, an explosion. That that was the area. You know, the, the, the venture exchange it used to be Vancouver and then it was uh, acquired by the Toronto exchange. So it's right. really kind of an agglomeration now. Uh, but it's it's not only in resources. It's been kind of the area that's uh, been on the, the cutting edge of speculation in small cap stocks in every new and emerging sector from, you know, technology, biotech <clears throat> and cannabis. cannabis stocks, right? So uh, what's also happened is that the, uh, uh, the, the venture exchange has made it very much easier to do an IPO for companies rather than a reverse takeover. So the, what, what in the past, if a company failed or didn't uh, achieve its goals, you know, drilled some prospects, it didn't work out, they would uh, roll the stock back and somebody else would come in, take the shell, the publicly traded shell, and put it into a new deal, a new opportunity. Uh, and, and those shareholders would have at least another chance for some small bite at the apple again. But the exchange has made it much easier to do direct IPOs where you don't have to go back and, and, and find those shells. Uh, and it's also made it easier to create new shells that called CPCs that can uh, – uh, then become ongoing publicly traded companies. The end result is that there are a lot of legacy or zombie companies out there. Um, so it's kind of hard to keep to get an accurate handle on how many companies there are listed, how many real companies there are listed. But it's a few thousand I guess out there. I, <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's where I was really like how many, uh, like how many companies would you say are you know are sort of the you know, or real, like, which are like in your kind of wheelhouse, like what's the universe mm -hmm. of like, you know, legit, legit prospects out there. I, uh, pro I would say there's probably six or 700 companies that, uh, deserve me taking a look at and, uh, given time constraints, I probably look at a few hundred a year. 
in, in some detail. I typically talk to, you know, have extensive conversations with two, not as many as two companies a day, uh, you know, typically five or more in a week. So um, it takes a lot of due diligence. But uh, like I say, there, there's very few companies that come to me uh, where I don't know at least, uh, you know, a few members of their board or management team and have dealt with them in the past. Okay. Excellent. So that's, that's a good, decent universe, 600 plus company. It's a pretty healthy yep. universe. So, um, so Brian, uh, I want to, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and, uh, I want to follow up with you, uh, you know, uh, probably the next, uh, couple of weeks or so to, to see yep. what's happening with the market. And uh, anybody that wants to get uh, some of your latest picks, they could uh, click on that link below, which is going to go to the gold newsletter uh, for the special offer. And, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll check back with you again soon. Great, Jack. Great being with you. Thank you, Brian.